The following program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. The ultimate cover. As a base commander in the Canadian Air Force, Colonel Russell Williams comforted families of the fallen, rubbed shoulders with the Prime Minister, and even flew planes for the Queen. But no one, including his wife, knew that he was also a sexual deviant, burglar, rapist, and murderer. And today, what began as fetish and fantasy led to a life sentence of solitary misery. For more than 20 years, he was a model airman and husband, described as a bright, shining star of the Canadian Air Force. Tonight, he is the most notorious pervert, rapist, and serial killer in recent Canadian history. After four days of stomach-churning evidence led to a life sentence, a nation wonders how this married colonel could have led such a deplorable double life. How could anybody do such a horrible, horrible thing? Over his flawless career, Russell Williams rose from decorated pilot to commander of support missions in Afghanistan and became the man in charge of Canada's largest and busiest air base. But through those years of overachievement, there were urges. And five years ago, at age 42, he began acting on his fetish for women's underclothes by breaking into homes of strangers and acquaintances alike to dress up, masturbate, and steal samples for his personal collection. You ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? I have never been interviewed like this. Oh, uh no? -huh. Okay. More than 80 of his home invasions went unsolved until 27-year-old Jessica Lloyd disappeared in January. Detectives found distinctive tire and boot tracks near her home, and a week later, a sharp-eyed officer noticed the suspicious tread matched the tires on Williams' SUV. This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago. Okay. When his boots matched as well, detectives were certain they had their man. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. This is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago, and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house, and I need to know why. William sat frozen in the interrogation room, agonizing his own fate. But eventually, he came clean, and over a 10-hour confession described two rapes, 82 burglaries, and the murders of both Lloyd and 37-year-old Corporal Marie-France Camus. Well, let, me, let me ask you this. Did you like or dislike these women? I didn't know any of them. In both cases, he tied them up, beat and raped them repeatedly for hours while recording it all on video. On one occasion, he stopped to actually adjust the lighting while ignoring his victim's pleas. If I die, Lloyd cries out on video, will you make sure to let my mom know that I love her? Well, well let me, let's talk about Jessica because she was there with you for the whole day, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of feelings were you experiencing while you were with her that day? Oh, she was a very nice girl. Can you tell me why you killed her? Right. Do you know why you killed her? Well, I think I killed her because I knew that uh, her story would be recognized. Her story would be recognized? How do you mean? Well, because she knew I was taking pictures. He seems to be intact enough to realize that uh, he, this is embarrassing and that he would have some shame at acknowledging fully that he did these things on, in contrast to a total uh, psychopath that would be uh, ebullient and uh, almost uh, triumphant in uh, saying, yeah, I did this uh, to her and bitch deserved it. Dr. Michael Stone is a forensic psychiatrist who studied and cataloged hundreds of deviant killers for his book, The Anatomy of Evil. So you have how many different gradations of evil? 22? 22. And where does he fit? on the evil chart? Either 18, which is moderately prolonged torture, or 22 for considerably prolonged and, and very agonizing. So high up on the scale. Worst to the worst. Yes. Dr. Stone says Williams may be the most highly functioning serial killer he has ever seen, and his military discipline actually helped him lead two separate lives. He's also unique in that he started his crimes later in life. And he's among the very few serial killers who like to pose in women's clothing. 
Dennis Rader, the notorious BTK killer who murdered 10 in Kansas, was another. Yes, I, uh, I had some sexual fantasies. And I took her to the basement and eventually uh, hung her. But while BTK never expressed remorse, Williams did display empathy for his wife during his confession. What made you decide to, to tell me this tonight? Mostly uh, to make my life's life easier. And he sniffled in court as he told the judge, quote, I have committed despicable crimes, Your Honor. In the process, betrayed my family, my friends, and colleagues on the Canadian forces. The ability to talk about these things would be more very uncommon. Psychopaths are it's one of the key ingredients is not to have remorse. Uh, even Jeffrey Dahmer, who was not a full, flat-out psychopath, had some measure of remorse. Uh, when he was put in prison and so on. I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. So where does the science stand on nature versus nurture in this particular case? You seem to think that he was hardwired for this sort of brand of evil. It wasn't beaten into him by abusive parents. Right. Is there a section of the brain that he, he's lacking? Is he lacking the empathy gene? He, he may have a deficiency uh, in the certain areas of the brain if the parents beat the heck out of the kid or uh, there was terrible neglect. So there are some environmental forces that may make the person more inclined to crime, but they, those forces don't make a person a paraphilic. That those forces make the person more inclined to violent crime, perhaps, mm -hmm. but not to the sexual paraphilia, which is wired in uh, from the get-go. Though his parents split when he was young, there was no evidence of abuse as Williams excelled in expensive schools. Yet another detail to make him the subject of fascination for criminal scientists and the object of loathing for everyone else. Uh, we want him locked in there till the day he dies. How do you feel about what you've done? Like what? Uh, disappointed. Given the risk of retribution from other prisoners, Williams began his sentence in solitary today, and a bit later he'll be court-martialed and stripped of his colonel stripes. Are you ready? everybody, it's Jeff. <laughs> Hope everybody's uh, having a good day here for Saturday. <laughs> uh, has been pretty nice here. It wasn't, it's not cold really today. It was uh, partly sunny and uh, the snow was melting pretty quick, you know, because so far this winter the the kind of snow we've been getting has been, you know, wet and heavy, and you know when it's like that, it, it melts quick. So there's still grass <laughs> you can see on the ground. I've been trying to do a recording driving through Bangor here in the winter time, but it looks like hell because there's no snow on the ground, so I can't do it. <laughs> um, I'm gonna have to wait probably till February uh, before we start to get any snow, but I can't, I, you know, I'm trying to update things and I can't do it because the weather's not cooperating, <laughs> you know, um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's what's going on. Uh, and of course, you know, yesterday I was working on a video blog there of the, uh, the continual votes here for the Speaker of the House, and just as I was finished with it and ready to upload it, uh, it came out on the news that uh, Kevin McCarthy got the got the vote, and so it kind of rendered all what I had said in that thing kind of moot, and because it was old news already. So that's you know that's the kind of thing you got to deal with if you're trying to be you know commenting on news of the day or something because 
certain things will change so fast that you just can't keep up with it you know so you kind of have to pick and choose you know what you want to talk about and hope that you know <laughs> it's still relevant the next day um but uh, i was i i was i surprised that he got it no because i think he he wasn't going to quit for one thing and the second thing was that he was working deals in the back room somewhere is he going to be effective as Speaker of the House? I don't think so. Because um, now he knows how many people don't like him. So he's not going to be able to get much cooperation from, from the people in his party. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So he's he's just going to be a lame duck speaker. And he'll he'll do his two years and then he'll they'll vote him out. Somebody else will replace him. So uh, that's probably how that's going to go with him. Um, but, you know... Lauren Boebert is out there shooting her mouth off, saying, no, the, the, uh, you haven't seen nothing yet. You know, okay, I'm shaking in my boots here, Lauren. You know, people have been saying stuff like that, you know, for years, you know, about the cracking and all this crap that's going to happen, you know, after, you know, I'm just tired of hearing these these fake soothsayers come out and say that, you know, the Republicans are going are gonna to rise again or some damn thing. Ain't going to happen, <laughs> okay? Ain't going to happen. They're going to be the same miserable bunch of people they were yesterday, okay? So forget it. I ain't buying it. All right. Now, uh, to the topic at hand here, uh, I, I wanted to discuss this story here uh, that happened in Ontario, Canada, uh, in Tweed, actually, the, the town of Tweed. Uh, happened in 2010. That's when the story kind of broke, I guess, was, was 2010. And um, the guy, David Russell Williams... Um, who's 59 years old now? Uh, at the, you know, he was uh, the colonel of CFB Trenton. He was the the base commander. Okay, um, I think he had just got that position not not too much before 2010. He just, he's, you know, uh, he got to that base, got command of it, and uh, you know, for a while, you know, he was uh, flying VIPs. Uh, back and forth from uh, England, you know, to Canada, and he actually had the Queen a couple of times on his plane, uh, and you know, he, he kind of uh, became sort of an icon in that in that small community there. I mean, it just uh, people really thought he was something uh, to be given, you know, this uh, so much responsibility, um, and plus he did a lot of things in the community as well. You know, his uh, his name carried weight uh, in Tweed uh, for, you know, doing, uh, you know, charities or something like that, you know, for the base or whatever. Uh, they'd always get him. And plus, his face was always on the news, the local news all the time. So, you know, he was, he was quite an icon. You know, people knew him. That made it so hard for people to believe that uh, he was capable of doing what he did, okay, when it come out. Uh, at the end, he was convicted of first-degree murder, sexual assault, forcible confinement, breaking and entering, and he got a life sentence. Um, and he'd been doing these crimes since 2007 uh, to 2010. So it's three years he was he was doing all this shit while he was there. So I'm assuming that he started right off <clears throat> once he got there. But the thing that didn't start right off was the murders. Okay, at first, it was breaking into people's homes and stealing girls' underwear. Uh, and then he'd bring it to his home, and he'd put it in a, in a tote, plastic tote, okay? And I guess he had a couple of boxes of that. I mean, it was just, they were filled right to the top. I mean, he, he obviously was a busy person on the off hours, as he was during the off, you know? So, he had a lot. Okay, he had a lot, and and he also had took selfies of himself uh, wearing some of these things. Okay, uh, and so they found flash drives of pictures of him in these stuff. I mean, the stuff. I don't, you know, that's the one thing I don't understand about about these people is they always leave evidence. Okay, uh, and they get surprised when when these when these things are found. I mean. They, and this guy didn't really hide, didn't make much effort to hide this stuff, which is why I can't imagine why his wife never stumbled onto any of that shit. 
especially the underwear. I mean, how can how could anybody hide those big old tote boxes anywhere and, and your wife not, you know, saying, what's in that, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, it just, it doesn't seem possible, okay? It doesn't seem possible. But, you know, for some reason, for all those three years, his wife never questioned a damn thing about what he was, uh, what he had in those things, okay? <clears throat> so, um, some women, I guess, are not very inquisitive about seeing things or whatever, uh, or maybe that their their lives were so different from one another, even though they were married, that you know they just uh, they weren't at home much, <laughs> okay. Uh, and maybe that's what he depended on was that, you know, she was doing her thing and he was doing his thing. And, you know, there was never time to just go nosing around the house looking, you know, you know, and she had no reason to suspect that he was up to anything. Um, so she just trusted him. Uh, and I guess most people are, you know, of the mind that, you know, until you give cause to un not trust somebody, um, you know, they're going to trust you. And I suppose that's the way it has to be, right? I mean, unless, you know, you can't assume somebody's lying to you unless you know at some point in the past they did, okay? Uh, until they do, you kind of trust that they're telling you the truth. I mean, you know, that's the way you should treat everybody is give them the benefit of the doubt until you, they give you uh, some evidence that they, uh, you know. So anyway, while <clears throat> that was going on, uh, he was doing his job on the base and... Uh, uh, like I said, he was creating a, a a pretty good facade for the community to make it very difficult. I don't even know. I don't even think that this guy even realized, you know, that he was actually creating his own uh, alibi, I guess, if you want to call it, you know, where people were just not going to believe it uh, unless there was a smoking gun there that would say that he did it. And the smoking gun was actually a very small. Uh, thing that happened that even though after three years of him doing this stuff it was only just this one thing that really got the police's attention okay that led to him being arrested and let me let me uh, read this off of here uh, to explain it clearly um, a, a 27 year old named Jessica Lloyd had gone missing on January the 28th 2010 uh, the investigators identified distinctive uh, tire tracks left in the snow along the north tree line of her property, okay, uh, approximately 100 meters north of her home. One week after her disappearance, the Ontario Provincial Police conducted an extensive canvassing of all motorists using the highway near her home from 7 p.m. Uh, until <coughs> 6 a.m. on February the 4th, the next morning looking for the tire tread. So what they did is they, when they went back into the snow, uh, they they just took some pictures, I guess, of it. Uh, I don't know if they made a mold of it because I mean, they might have had computer technology to do that for them, but they got the prints of it and they were going around comparing those prints to everybody's vehicles that they, that were coming and going. So they had like a, like a, uh, like a block, a roadblock there. And they would just stop the vehicles and they just check out the tires. Uh, as people were coming and going, and they to eliminate them off the list as they went, okay? Uh, on, uh, Colonel Williams, his vehicle had those tires, okay? They found out, you know, that uh, that kind of vehicle, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of people have those kind of tires on the kind of vehicle that he was driving, okay? Which was, I think, was like a SUV or some damn thing like that. Okay, so that put him on the list as a suspect, even though people just assumed that he wasn't, but they were just following orders, I guess. Uh, Williams was driving his Nissan Pathfinder that day rather than the BMW he usually drove, and an officer noticed the resemblance of his tire treads. Uh, these were subsequently matched to the treads near Lloyd's home. Uh, on February the 7th, uh, Williams was at his newly built home uh, in the Ottawa suburb of Westboro, where his wife lived full-time and he lived part-time when he was called by the Ottawa Police Service and asked to come in for questioning. So right off the bat, I mean, it was like, what? Uh, they were doing the, the uh, you know, the the, uh, the uh, car checks on the February the 4th, and three days later, he gets a call. 
from the police. So that was pretty fast, okay, uh, to go like that. Um, but before they before they called them in for questioning, they they had to inform the military, uh, the base that they were going to question him. That was you know his rights, I guess. Um, and so uh, they were there was I think there were two or three members of the base. His, you know, lawyers or something like that that were there as they were watching the interrogation go on. So uh, he was interrogated at the police headquarters uh, by uh, Officer James Smith, or Smythe, I guess that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> uh, he was confronted with the evidence gathered, you know, at uh, what they had picked up, uh, with the interrogation lasting 10 hours overall, okay? Uh, and while they were doing that, I believe they were searching his home. Okay, I think they went ahead and started searching his home. They, uh, so uh, they had the they had things going. Okay. Uh, then during the uh, you know interrogation, he started to confess to his crimes. Uh, in the confession, he gave details and admitted to dozens of crimes, including the the sexual assaults in Tweed. Most of the assaults in Ottawa occurred at homes within walking distance of his new home where he lived with his wife. Other break-ins and thefts occurred in uh, Belleville and in Tweed where the couple had a cottage since 2004. He also told police where they could find evidence inside his home, uh, including hidden keepsakes and photographs that he took of his victims and of himself modeling in their underwear. Uh, he then identified on a map where he dumped Lloyd's body and next morning, Williams led them to the woman's body in a secluded area uh, on Cary Road, uh, 13 minutes away from where he lived. So, you know, I, people, I guess they figure, they wonder why, why did he just confess? I mean, because uh, maybe, maybe he figured, well, they're going to find my stuff. You know, they were already into his home uh, searching through things. I mean, they, they, they move quick. In, in Canada when it comes to stuff like that, I guess. Uh, no sooner was he on the list of possible suspect, uh, they got a, you know, uh, permission to go and search his home for any evidence, you know, to link him to the crimes, and they found mother load there, and I think they must have told him during the investigation, you know, and said, look, we just uh, found this, we found that, okay, and I guess he figured, you know, I can't lie. You can actually watch this investigation on YouTube. They uh, the, uh, the interrogation, rather. I'm sorry. You can actually watch this interrogation on YouTube, uh, and the guy is very, very um, deliberate in the answers he gives. Okay, very cautious about what he says and how he says it. Okay, because I, you know, he understands. You know, this is, you know. Uh, you know he he did something bad and, and everything and he and he doesn't want you know these the uh, the investigation to you know get derailed as it were uh, by something he might have said and they misunderstood okay um, you know for people would think well he normally the person would just lie well in a way he did lie because they had already called they already talked to him before when they visited him at his home in the area where all these things were happening and they asked him if they if he knew anything about what was going on in the area if he saw anything or anything you know and he told them no but the, that guy across the road over there is kind of weird so you might want to go talk to him you know so he he was lying even then okay he was you know uh, keeping the investigators from getting to the truth uh so yeah he did lie but when they when he was in the interrogation room, I think he realized that the jig was up, you know, as they say, and there's no point in lying uh, because they got you. And he knew that whatever lawyers were there to defend him, uh, they were they were just going to hang him out to dry because that's the military. You know, if he uh, if they found all this evidence, there wasn't a way in hell he was going to get away with that, and the military would see to it. Okay, um, and so he just I guess he figured you know this is as good as catching me red-handed. Um, it was just difficult for him uh, to lay down all the facts as it was as as he remembered them, uh, knowing that uh, his wife was going to hear about it. Okay, and 
it was it was pretty it was pretty uh, dramatic I guess this case here uh, and many people on the base were so friggin upset uh, there was a few officers there that just they felt ill uh, knowing what had what what he was had done and uh, I can't imagine. You know, I, I was in the Air Force, and, and I'll tell you, you know, if it would ever come out that the base commander was involved in something like that, uh, you know, it would have looked bad on everybody, okay? Um, because then you figure that, you know, they were all stupid and they had no idea, you know, they're not aware of what's going on. Um, and this was a guy the community, you know, really held in high regard. The impact of that would have been severe okay uh, for that community and it just it's just another lesson and why when it comes to looking for sexual predators you can't rule out anything okay you just can't you can't assume that because somebody appears they're like a good person on the outside that they can't do it no you can't because this guy here showed that he can be a good person on the outside when he wants them to see that and then on the inside he's got the devil just waiting to come out okay <laughs> So we can't we can't tell. So because we can't tell, we have to assume then that, uh, it, you know, anybody can be guilty of that. Until the police find some evidence, uh, you can't rule out anybody. Uh, and so it's one of those situations where a community got woke up to the fact that you know, good people don't always appear aren't always good. They they hide something really dark, and you just have to. You can't be too surprised about things like that when it happens. And I think that was probably the hardest part about this case and why it shocked not just Canada, but fucking the whole world, <laughs> you know? Because this guy, like I said, flew the queen, or, uh, the, the queen around, all right? And I imagine when it got, you know, when it got to her, what happened, I mean, I imagine she was pretty pissed, you know? Uh, so, you know, it, it was a story that you know, it got global attention. And, uh, <clears throat> I can only imagine, you know, how, you know, they must have, you know, I keep, I think about like the, the Bill Cosby case, you know, and, uh, cases like that where the, you know, where, where the people are just so, you know, uh, shocked by what they hear about what, what this person did or whatever. Uh, and we see how it happened on the on the uh, level of, of somebody being an actor, okay? Uh, as with a base commander who isn't pretending to be a base commander, uh, who you know really is in real life. I mean, that's a person. The impact of that is real, and it's just uh, uh, you know somebody you see every day, practically. If you're if you're a member of the Air Force there or something, and you see that. Uh, this guy and you know everybody talks good about him uh, it's not a TV show it's just you know this is who he is and he really was doing this stuff uh, and it really made a lot of people sick to their stomach to know that you know this guy was was out there doing this shit you know while he was being mr. mr. Air Force or whatever you know Canadian Air Force <laughs> um, so let's let's go to commercial break we'll be right back is me. This is me. This is me! This is me. I'm Alex Curtis. I'm a lobsterman in Maine and this is me. I'm Ruth McLaughlin and this is me. I'm Eric Hopkins. I'm an artist, and this is me. This. This. This is me. 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 This is me. This is me. This is me. At the end of the journey, the main thing is you, original. Program scheduled to bring you the following special report from ABC News. Where are we going?
Turn the goddamn cameras on. I'm gonna show you something. Read that, pal. Read it. Turn the cameras on. All three, you hold it. I want on national television. I've been called a kidnapper, an extortionist, a thug, and everything else. I want it on all three national channels. I've got friends all over the country. You read it. February 10th. Okay, listen a little, Tony. Where are the cameras? I want them to see this guy. God damn it, you guys are those... Kodaks, get out of the way. Where's Mr. Heckman? Come here, Fred. You're a hell of a man, baby. Where's my brother Jimmy? He's coming. He's Hi, Mark. Come here. Billy? Hi, baby. Will you guys be good and quiet? We'll let this gentleman read that. He goddamn near made me blow his goddamn brains out. Jimmy? I am the only motherfucker mean enough to have withstood this without having a goddamn stroke or a heart attack. Hold it. Are we on all three? Yes. All three? Yes. Put it on him, pal. We're partners in this. By the way, hold it. Where's Mr. Gallagher? Hi, Bobby. Come here, Bob Young. You're my buddy. He's this man seeing me suffer and die right there asking him. Where's Mr. Gallagher? Chief. All I've got in them bottles is gasoline. I just wanted to fry the son of a bitch. But I had a rig, pal. Don't you shit yourself none. I believe you. Jimmy. Okay, read it. February 10th, 1977. This statement is being made to try and state the items that Mr. Kuritsis alludes to as being the illegal. Hold it, hold it. I want this goddamn thing understood. I'll read it. February 10th, 1977. I want a glass of water. This statement is being made to try and state the items that Mr. Caritas alludes, and I don't like that word. I charge, and they've admitted it. Alludes to as being illegal and unethical acts of the whole group. Keep the mic down. Number one, Eisner Osco. This, this lease negotiates, this lease negotiation approved the Caritza site and had a definite interest in building there. We showed Eisner Osco other sites, but to date they have not made any commitments to the best of our knowledge. Although we, the Hall Group, will use our best efforts to secure same if there is a proven interest. Number two. Eisner Osco, by the way, was my tenant. Give me a drink, pal. Give me a drink. And there's your beautiful baby. Any day now. Really? You're eating Doritos? He's eating Doritos on my ultrasound. Do you see what I have to do? I know. <laughs> that. Entertainment value of a lifetime. I loved it. It was the best performance I've seen in a lifetime. I loved the show. I liked it very much. He's a very entertaining man. It's well worth the money. Now appearing in Charlottetown, coming to Halifax November 6th to the 18th, and St. John November 20th through the 26th.
okay, uh, he appeared uh, before the Ontario Court of Justice in Bellevue, Ontario, uh, video link. They use a video link, okay, uh, from the Quint, uh, Quint Detention Center on July 22nd of 2010, where his next court appearance was set for August the 26th uh, through the video link as well. Uh, he waived his right to a preliminary inquiry and, and had his next appearance scheduled at the Ontario Superior Court of Justice on October the 7th, 2010. Williams' lawyer, you know, said that his client would plead guilty uh, to the charges filed against him, okay? And I imagine that was probably arranged with the military as well. You know, they figure, you know, you, know, you plead guilty and, uh, you know, because at that time, you know, they took away his rank, his position and everything like that. So he was a nobody at that point. <laughs> In the, as far as the military is concerned. <clears throat> uh, on the first day of, of his trial and guilty plea, uh, details emerged about other sexual assaults he committed, uh, including that of a, a mother who was awake, uh, woken with a blow to the head while she and her baby were asleep in her house. I mean, it's, this guy, I mean, he didn't, he didn't discriminate, I guess. He just went right after whoever he thought, you know. Um, he also had a pedophiliac tendencies, which meant he would go after kids. And that explains the, the, the kids' underwear that they found, right? So he have to be a pedophile to want that stuff. Um, and some of the girls were like nine years old, for Christ's sake. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were... Uh, attempts that he tried to break in some places that he couldn't get into okay so the other the 82 that we know that he broke into there was actually more he tried to break into but couldn't do it okay probably because of home security or whatever so it would have been more than that uh so after he was doing break-ins which apparently got boring to him he started leveling up to sexual assaults with you know no penetration basically okay and then finally he would go into rape and then murder, okay? So he escalated. So the crimes that he did before he got to that base as that job, okay, uh, were probably not, you know, to that level. They were probably just what he was doing when he first got there was, you know, uh, you know, following girls around or something like that, you know, peeking through the windows, eventually breaking into the house to get underwear. You know what I'm saying? He was working his way up. Because, you know, until you catch somebody, they're going to assume that they can get away with this. And if they say, oh, I, I've been doing this for a few months, let's escalate. You know, they feel more comfortable in continuing to do the crime, okay, until they get caught. They can't help themselves, okay? These fuckers can't help themselves. They, as soon as they feel like they can't, nobody can touch them, uh, they keep escalating, okay? That's that's the problem with the brain there, you see what I'm saying? Uh <clears throat> And who knows, I mean, how this guy ever got to be an officer if he had a failing like that. I mean, I thought these 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 places, these academies, could weed those fuckers out. <laughs> Apparently not. Okay. Uh, and so he, he took thousands of pictures of his crimes and kept all his photos on a computer, which, of course, they got all that out. Um... Uh, the prosecuting attorney, uh, he presented the pictures of, of Colonel Williams here dressed in underwear and bras he had stolen, frequently masturbating while lying on the beds of his victims. Uh, I can't imagine how people would have, you know. Some of the photos uh, on the first day of his trial were published in newspapers. <laughs> You know, they, they got a little, their, their standards over there for, for what they put on their newspapers are a little less, uh, you know, than ours, okay? And, you know, and <laughs> believe it or not, uh, some of the newspapers, uh, you know, explained uh, troubling, you know, you know, although they were troubling, that the photos were published because they captured the essence of the crimes of Williams and showed the, the true nature of them. Uh, among the news media that published some of the released photographs were the Montreal Gazette and the Toronto Star. Um, 
and uh, Ontario Superior Court Justice Robert Scott sentenced Williams uh, to two concurrent terms of life imprisonment with no consideration of parole for 25 years. Uh, the Governor General of Canada, David Johnson, revoked Williams's commission and later all his medals, uh, and he was expelled from the Canadian uh, forces for service misconduct. <laughs> it seems like a a mild label to what he did, service misconduct. It's, it wasn't misconduct, it was fucking crime. You know, uh, the most serious uh, extant charge. Uh, after being returned to the forces, his uniform was burned, his medals were cut into pieces, and his commission scroll uh, was shredded. These actions were similar to a military degradation. Uh, his Nissan Pathfinder was crushed and scrapped. Uh, he was at first incarcerated at Kingston Penitentiary in the prison's segregation unit. Uh, after the prison began the process of closing, he was moved to the Port Cartier Institution, uh, a maximum security prison in Port Cartier, Quebec. Uh, on May the 10th, 2012, the Canadian forces announced that it had made a quote-unquote terrible mistake by publishing a booklet with a photograph bearing the likeness of Williams in the background and ordered 4,000 copies of that book destroyed. The photograph was incidental to the subject matter of the book, but the image was felt to be offensive. And yeah, I can imagine a lot of people got pissed, you know, he somehow was in the photograph, but people don't want to be reminded of that, of what he, this clown. And uh, so, yeah, it was, somebody obviously didn't, they didn't do it on purpose. They just probably didn't realize that he was in the picture when they put it. So, <laughs> um, there he sits. And uh, his wife divorced him eventually, right in 2012. I mean, uh, no, in, in 2010, she began the divorce uh, filing. Um, and uh, it wasn't finalized until 2014, so it took them, took them four years to, make the, to finish the divorce. I don't know why it took so fucking long, you know. <laughs> Um, but, you know, they made, you know, Hollywood there made a lot off of that. They made a movie of it and wrote some books about it. And, you know, it's, uh, but I tell you, you know, if you look this up on YouTube, none of the movies that you, or books you read about this really can explain or, or describe the interrogation that this guy went, uh, what they put him through in there, uh, and I think the FBI uses that that video of that interrogation as a like part of their training or something for people uh, in the in uh, the interrogators or something, because this guy that they had interrogating him was very professional at what he did. And he had to be because he wasn't just going after a regular uh, c a civilian here. He was going after one of Canada's top officers in their air force. Okay. And so the military wanted to make sure that he was, that things were going above board, that there was no shenanigans to try to railroad this guy into, into something, into a confession, okay? So they had to get the best of the best to interrogate this guy so they knew it was only up and up, okay? And such they did. And that's why it took all those hours, because this guy wasn't going to let him go. I mean, they had they had the evidence coming out their ass at home, but that you know, in some cases, some trials that wouldn't even be enough. <laughs> you know, that wouldn't even be enough to convict somebody, especially a person that was as popular as he was. It wouldn't be enough. So they the the actual confession was the actual Rosetta Stone here for uh, for his you know eventual uh, going to prison. Without that, you know, the the uh, the. Uh, coin would have still been spinning in the air as to you know his chances of actually getting convicted um but when they got that confession out of him that was you know as far as their the interrogator was concerned that was an incredible victory uh that they got this guy to confess it wasn't easy and the guy wasn't being belligerent and you know they questioned him about it and 
you know, he just, uh, some part of this guy still had logic operating in, in his head, you know, to believe, you know, to, to, to understand how that could be, I don't know, you know, that it, logically he, he knew he was caught, okay, and he wasn't going to lie about it anymore and he wasn't going to hide it. It was difficult for him to come out and say it because there was long pauses in the interrogation where he's just sitting there, not moving, okay, trying to absorb the fact that, you know, there's no way out. I mean, you could see him trying to calculate. It's like playing chess, trying to figure out a way out of this thing, and he couldn't do it. He just, he didn't have the time, really, to come up with a, an excuse or a lie, and there was nothing that he could say that could actually explain away all the shit they were finding in his house. So he knew he was caught. You know, all the, he played all the cards he could play, and he was out, you know, and so he admitted to it. And, you know, this, the interrogator made him feel like, well, I'm your friend or something, and, you know, you can tell me, and, you know, you know what I'm saying? He was trying to make it comforting for, for this, for the colonel to uh, say, you know, to, to, uh, to confess, okay? Make him trustworthy, as it, as it were. And uh, all along, this guy, you know, I don't see how the hell he was keeping from, like, wanting to beat the living shit out of that fucker, you know, for any of the things he was saying. Um, but he, he kept it, you know, he kept it in check. You know, and like I said, that is a mark of a really good interrogator. If he could sit, like, two feet from somebody and sit there and ask questions to a, an out-and-out -out serial kill, a killer and rapist and not want to, you know, beat the hell out of him. I mean, that, that says a lot about the person's uh, will uh, to do their job and do it professionally, okay? Uh, and it's good that they use that, uh, that video as a teaching tool for future interrogators to learn how to do their job, uh, you know, and do it well. I mean, not to get wrapped up in the guy's emotion, uh, but simply to just let that reflect back to him, okay? While you're sitting there... Uh, plotting the moves in, in the questions because every question they ask you was a, as a move on a, like a chessboard to get you to say the confession okay when they try to box you into the point where even you can't uh, talk your way out of it okay um and i'm surprised he didn't ask for you know an attorney or something like that before he started yakking but you know i guess like i said maybe that was still a no-go for him because even with an attorney he still would have had to confess something Especially after all the shit they found in his house, you know, there's no good reason why that would have been there. Okay, <laughs> so um, So this guy led a double life You know for You know all this time and it was only then that one little thing where a girl was turned up missing Where the police actually decided to take that tire print if it wasn't for that tire print uh, initiative that they did uh, I don't think they ever would have got this guy. I really don't. But because, you know, that, that vehicle that uh, was a Pathfinder was noticed, and they did a, uh, uh, you know, a print match on that, on the tire, uh, that really helped significantly in narrowing down, you know, who they needed to look for. And uh, it's just, it goes to show you that, you know, you, you have to be pretty slick to get away with a crime these days uh, because of the technology that, that's out there uh, to you know connect you to these crimes. And there's a determined person who wants to find the answer to a, a crime is going to use every means at their disposal to do it if they're really worth their salt. Okay, and uh, these people are out of the mind that, you know, they're doing a job to help other people to get past something. I mean, this is important to the people, the victims. Uh, it's very important to them. And uh, so they make sure that, you know, if this was my kid or this was my wife or whoever, um, I would want to be on this thing night and day until I got some answers here. And, you know, it's, uh, that's how they are, okay? Just as serious, uh, just as uh, motivated as the criminals are to do what they do, these investigators are equally motivated to find the answers as best they can, okay? That's the thing. You've got these two extremes at work here. Um, and that's why this, this, this case, this investigation moved right along. I mean, he was, he was suspected 
and caught in the same year, just, you know, six, seven months later. Okay, it started in January, and by the by December, he was already convicted and locked up, okay? So, that's pretty quick, okay? That's pretty damn quick. Because um, sometimes, I mean, we've heard of stories of cases that have gone on for years, and they're no closer to a solution years later than they were when they started. And that's partly because of police not doing their job right in, you know, in the initial days of the crime, uh, trying to piece together, you know, whatever evidence is laying around, uh, somebody screws up, you know, and a lot of investigators think that the more cops you have involved in the, in the scene of the crime, uh, the greater the chance is that they could screw the scene up, you know, the crime scene up and, uh, you know, some some key evidence could just get disappeared you know somewhere along the way you know either they step on something or whatever because they you know they immediately they don't think about sealing off an area and waiting for the, the you know the detective to show up to do the initial investigation uh they start walking through the house or walking through the area you know and they're stepping on things they don't even realize could be evidence you know <laughs> um so yeah it's it's uh you know, it's a it's sort of a tug of war between different aspects of our police force uh, when it comes to investigating a crime, or you know. But like I have to say that this one case here, which is a memorable case, okay. You know, years after this happened, I mean, people still talk about it. You know, you still see people on YouTube uh, uh, talk about uh, you know the case itself and you know the sky and everything and. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of reached the popularity of the John Bonnet Ramsey kind of thing. You know, it's just, it's one of those things that still shocks people to this day that somebody in the military that was so well known could be this evil. And that's why we keep talking about it because there is a lesson in there, in this case that everybody should, uh, should imbue in their minds about you know, how we can't discard anybody, <clears throat> you know, from a crime uh, until people start finding ways of narrowing down the suspects, okay? Until we do that, we can't rule out anybody. We have to assume that the person's still among us and he's pretending to be something he's not, okay? And until that's found, I mean, hey, I mean, I know that's being paranoid, but, you know, for Christ's sake, it's better to be paranoid and report something that seems out of the ordinary, okay, than it is to just sit down and just assume it's nothing. And then, you know, that could be the thing that gets the person, you know. So it's always important to, to report anything during these kind of crime things that you may or may not have seen, that something didn't look right or feel right about this person or that person when you was talking to them. You know, any little thing. Anything in, the, in this day with technology and stuff like that, that little thing could be more important than you even realize. Okay, um, and so cooperating with the law enforcement during a, a crime like something like that, uh, it's best to tell them everything. It's like when you go talk to a therapist for with the problems you have, don't hold back anything. Okay, you hold back something, and that's just going to make it harder on you to get to get better to to you know make yourself better. They have to have everything that you know they need to know, all right, in order to know exactly uh, what it is that's wrong with you or something like that. This is the same thing when an investigation, think of it as they're trying to, they're picking through somebody's brain or something like that to find out things, okay? Uh, you got to understand that these people, every little thing that they do could lead to something, okay? There is no perfect crime, okay? Criminals will always leave some clue behind, even the smallest thing, all right? And if you don't tell them, and if you know, if you see something that seemed out of the ordinary and didn't fit, you know, uh, it's better to just tell the police. I mean, and, and then you kind of put the ball in their hands to decide whether or not they should move on it. Okay, uh, and uh, at least that way, you can't say, "Well, I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't contribute anything. I didn't try." Okay, I gave them something, and it was up to them to decide if it was relevant or not. Okay, so you're better off just telling them. Because you may never know, that could be the thing that, that breaks the, the wall, as it, as it were, uh, to solving a crime. And uh, 
Uh, I'm glad in this in this situation it was a small thing uh, that broke the case and they found this guy uh, and it was as simple as a, as a tire track you know um, it may not seem like a lot to some people but you know matching up a tire track to something that they know belongs to the to the rapist or the killer or something it, it's a big thing you know it narrows down the, the suspect fuel considerably you know Okay, well, that's all I wanted to talk about for today. So I hope everybody has a great rest of the weekend. Uh, please keep your ears open for any COVID-19 news local. Um, we still got that new version of it out there floating around. Uh, and so we, they're already starting to suggest that people should start wearing masks again if you're going to be in crowded areas uh, just for your safety. They're not saying that it's out there in your area, but they're just hoping that some people will pay attention, okay, and and do that, so that way we can limit uh, how it's spreading around. Um, so, uh, subscribe and comment on this if you if you want to. I like to hear people's feedback, and I will uh, talk to you again later. So treat each other nice and take care.